In the invitation to today's event, and as Mrs. Helga Zepp LaRouche emphasized in her opening remarks, uh, we are at a very historic moment with an opportunity for a new global paradigm of international relations, as we've discussed. Something based on what we're referring to as this idea of win win collaboration among nations, or as Helga referenced Xi Jinping's statement, his call for a community of a shared future for all humanity. Now, if you just said these things to the average person in America, they might say, that sounds great, that sounds obvious, that's how the way, should, the, way the world should work. But unfortunately, real, the reality is this is actually a very revolutionary concept especially in terms of actual policy practiced. And the reality is, as Helga emphasized in her remarks, uh, global relations are still governed by a very different view, that of geopolitics. And I, wanted, I want to discuss today with my time uh, what are the ideological assumptions underlying geopolitics and how does Mr. LaRouche's work in the science of physical econom economics refute the entire ideological basis, the axiomatic basis of geopolitics as it's understood today. So one way to discuss this is geopolitics is very connected to the ideological assumption of what some might call a zero-sum game, or the assumption of limits to growth. So zero-sum game, for example, could be defined as follows. In game theory and economic theory, a zero-sum game is a mathematical representation of a situation in which each participant's gain or loss of utility is exactly balanced by the losses or gains of the utility of other participants. Maybe put more simply, if I win, you must lose. Or if you win, I must necessarily lose something. And this idea, this way of thinking, has had a profound effect on agricultural policy internationally in recent decades, recent generations, the subject of our discussion here today. Just for example, I'll note in passing, you can look at documents like the Declassified National Security Study Memorandum 200 by Henry Kissinger, in which it was argued that control over food production and agricultural supplies should be used to ensure the suppression of population growth in other nations. Or, for example, this declassified 1975 communication from someone who was the head of the United Kingdom's East Africa Department of their Foreign Commonwealth Office, in which he expressed this sentiment rather very clearly and bluntly. Quote, My view is that we should retain a fairly high level of interest in black Africa over the next five years, because it is likely to become much more important to us later on when the world's supply of raw materials have been further depleted. I include in this definition both minerals and agricultural commodities. Nor do I agree that we can contemplate with relative equanimity Russian or Chinese dominance in the area. Such dominance would give them, rather than ourselves, control over the sources of raw materials. Now, that's just a couple very brief examples of the idea of zero-sum game thinking or limits to growth thinking as expressed in actual concrete geopolitical policies and how this has affected agricultural policy internationally. Now, what I want to say today is that this is wrong. This is not only morally objectionable, which I think many people would agree with, but it is also scientifically False. To believe the idea of a zero-sum game implies that there is a finite amount of natural resources available to mankind, and therefore an absolute, a fixed, and an unchangeable limit to the level of population and the standard of living possible for the global population. Now, Mr. LaRouche has refuted this false assumption as demonstrated in his unique development of a science of physical economics. Mr. LaRouche has shown that the only valid metrics for human economic growth are changes in what he has defined as potential relative population density. That is, for any specific 
stage in the development of an economy, we can define a limit to the maximum potential population and living standards that could be supported relative to the, to the conditions of a given land area at that specific time. However, this is not an absolute distinction. It is not an absolute limitation. It is a limit defined by the scientific, technological, and cultural level of that economy. As we've been hearing throughout this conference today, scientific and technological revolutions completely transform the productive powers of the labor force. As Bob Baker discussed in the just astronomical increases in the productive powers of any individual single farmer when employed with higher technologies, supported by higher capital intensity, higher energy flux density. These revolutions create entirely new resource bases where resources didn't exist before. Anybody familiar with agriculture knows about the process of the discovery of nitrogen fixation from the atmosphere, whereas now the atmosphere became a resource for one of the most important um, contributions to agriculture. And these revolutions completely transform the potential habitability and the productivity of the land area, the territory that mankind is working with, with the development of what Mr. LaRouche has defined as new infrastructure platforms, meaning things like the amount of arable land available to mankind is not fixed. It can be changed. Water projects, land management, various things can increase and transform these territories. And so these are the kind of factors that contribute to changes and increases in the potential relative population density of the entire economy, which, as Mr. Lubrish has shown, is really the only true measure of economic growth. And this true understanding of real human economic growth is itself a refutation and a demonstration of the fallacy of this entire zero-sum game thinking or these limits to growth assumptions. Now, in 1988, Lyndon LaRouche delivered the keynote address to the second International Food for Peace Conference held in Chicago. And based on his superior physical economic approach, he gave the following assessment, which I want to just quote. He said at that time in 1988, we can increase the potential population density of this planet in the next 50 to 60 years by a factor of 10. If we use all the technology we had at the beginning of the 1970s and applied it freely on a global scale to all the development problems, including infrastructural technology, this planet could sustain between 50 and 25 billion people at a standard of living, at a standard comparable to what we used to enjoy in the United States when times were much better, about 20 years ago, when we had a better standard of living. So again, 1988, referring to the early 60s. With what we have available, that standard of living by a factor, we can increase, with what we have available, we can increase that standard of living by a factor of 40 to 50 times in terms of productivity over the next two to three generations. We have the means at hand to do so if we are determined. If we were to take the attitude that the United States had under the Kennedy Space Program, or what was actually the Eisenhower Kennedy Space Program from around 1958 to 65, if we maintain that, combined with policies of tax credits for investment of a suitable kind, with science enrichment programs, which I was, uh, with science enrichment programs in our schools and similar kinds of things, if we did that, nothing more than that, we could accomplish this task. If mankind on this planet had the political will to do just that, we could sustain by the end of two generations a potential population in the order of magnitude of 100 billion people, more comfortably, much better fed, much more secure, much freer, and much less crowded than today because we use the land more intelligently. And as Mr. LaRouche went on to discuss in this 1988 Food for Peace address, in terms of agriculture, this means rising to the standpoint of mankind managing the global biosphere as a whole, 
as a single system, as a totality. So that means things like focusing on increasing the percentage of sunlight reaching the earth that actually gets converted into productive activity of the biosphere itself, going into the production of biomass, increasing the energy flux density of the biosphere as a whole. That means more trees. That means developing more agricultural land, better developed agricultural land, rather than wasting effort and space building solar panels, for example. That means taking a better and more scientific look at things like CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. Well, we're now seeing that the temperature rise forecast by climate models is not occurring. The, the global temperature sensitivity to CO2 rise has been dramatically, dramatically overstated, and it's becoming clear that CO2 is not really a concern for driving climate change. Whereas, on the other hand, it has been shown by global satellite measurements and many other measurements, there is, there is actually a net growth in total biomass productivity directly attributed to the higher CO2 levels we're experiencing today compared to 30, 40 years ago. This has been estimated to be on the order of 6 to 10 percent total green biomass increase on the planet in the past 40 years, much of which is connected to the fact that CO2 is not only a food for plants, but it also ensures healthy and more stable plant growth. And this also means we need to think about utilizing the global water cycle in better and more intelligent ways. And uh, Dennis referenced the fact that I was a co-author on this EIR report, the, world, the New Silk Road Becomes the World Land Bridge, and I had off authored the chapter on the subject of water development in that book. And in recent years, I have had really the honor to work with Mr. LaRouche in many discussions and investigations of something he's been greatly interested in, which is the development of new revolutionary approaches to managing our global water system. And specifically what we've discussed as a galactic perspective on the management of water by understanding how our galaxy, the influence of our galactic system, actually influences and controls critical, critical aspects of our planet's water cycle in the atmosphere. This means we can no longer think of the Earth as an isolated body just floating in empty space, but our Earth is an integrated component of a much larger galactic system. Much can be said, but for example, we know that very long-term variations in the solar system's relation to the galaxy as our sun and its planets, our solar system travels through the galaxy and experiences different galactic environments, this is, has been shown to be the driver, the cause of the largest variations in climate over the past half billion years and longer. Variations that dwarf what we might think of as the uh, ice ages and interglacials, things that might be more familiar to people. Much larger changes than that caused by our galactic relation. This cause is created by the effects of what's referred to as galactic cosmic radiation, or what we might call the conditions of our own galaxy's very high-energy atmospheric system, and how that interacts with and intersects our own Earth's atmosphere, and what that does in terms of actually playing a critical role in cloud formation and also in the behavior of atmospheric water vapor. And this has not only been demonstrated on very long time scales, but even on the course of very short time scales. Down to the order of days, this effect has been demonstrated. So what does this have to do with the present water crisis, water challenges facing many parts of the world, and what does this have to do with agriculture? Well, much can be said, but I want to just reference the fact that very fascinating technologies have been developed which can, to some degree, mimic this galactic effect on our atmosphere and allow mankind to begin to actually manage, influence, and even control the atmospheric aspects of our water cycle. That means, in certain sense, controlling the weather, creating precipitation where it's needed, inhibiting precipitation where it isn't needed, and even influencing certain weather systems directly. 
And these systems have already been applied to benefit agriculture and for other needs in a number of trials all around the world in recent years and recent decades. Um, what are referred to as these electrical atmospheric ionization systems have been used to great effect uh, by managing what's referred to as the ionization conditions and controlling rainfall, controlling precipitation, et cetera. Now, for example, in certain trials of these systems, it's been demonstrated that these technologies have been able to generate 50,000 times more water per unit energy than even the most advanced desalination systems. So by tapping into this very unique situation of the atmospheric water vapor, a relatively low input tuned properly can induce the condensation and precipitation of the water that's there. So the point is with these and other means, we can develop a new global management of the Earth's water system, supplying the water needs for mankind, supporting all the agricultural needs for the planet far into the future. With this galactic approach, we should be thinking about mankind actually rising to a galactic level. We may still be operating here on Earth spatially, geographically, but mentally, creatively, this is mankind acting from the standpoint of understanding something, some principles about the organization of our entire galactic system, encapsulating that understanding emulating that in the human mind, and reshaping our actions accordingly. That is what mankind uniquely does. This is just another example of mankind's unique creative capability to rise to completely new levels of relationship with the natural universe around us. Through unique creative capability we find in the human mind. And it really is fundamentally that reason why there are no limits to growth for mankind, as Mr. LaRouche has shown. That geopolitics must end. And I would just conclude by saying, from the standpoint of an American here in the United States, perhaps most concerning about the current degeneration of the culture, cultural outlook of the West, is, is the lack of a, very, of a grounded, visionary sense of the future. As, as Mr. LaRouche said in his 1988 Food for Peace conference, a precursor to today's event, uh, we should look two to three generations ahead and fight to create a world where every single person on the planet within a significantly larger global population than today has a higher standard of living than what so-called first world nations are experiencing today. That is how Americans used to think, and that's how we must think again. Thanks. Thanks.